Okay. Romans chapter 3 then. So we'll go ahead and jump into this. We have 31 verses, so we'll have uh, kind of got these broken down into smaller segments here, but we'll read these verses, these, uh, we have got them blocked off here, and then we'll uh, give you some things. But this is where we really get into some very interesting and, and very uh, plain, plain doctrines uh, of the Bible. And uh, so we won't go back and review uh, chapters 1 or 2. We'll, we'll probably refer back to maybe some in, in, in chapter 3 here anyway. So that's what it says in verse 1. It says, What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way. So it's answering the question saying there is an advantage. Much every way. Chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid, yea, now here's a, here's a phrase we hear a lot, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. So under that little paragraph I have there, the advantage of being a Jew was because of the oracles of God. So when you look that up, probably don't need a definition, but the literal word means utterances. We don't see the word oracle mentioned very much in the Bible. I think it's mentioned, I wrote it down somewhere else, about uh, four or five different times. It's, it's, it's uh, only mentioned in the New Testament, oracle. The plural, I think, is only mentioned over in the uh, book in the Old Testament. So the point here it's saying, and I know we probably said this last week, so the advantage that a Jew has, and remember when we talked about, there's been three different times already in chapters 1 and 2 where it says to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. So in, in those two cases, one was when Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, and he talks about to the Jew first, also to the Greek. That's kind of what's being mentioned here, these oracles of God. So in other words, when a group of people like the Jewish people had the, the words of God, the influence of God, realized all those prophets, uh, people like David, the Lord would come and speak to them, and then they'd go and speak to the people, thus saith the Lord. So you take a nation like that, and, and, and it was the only nation on earth in which God said, you, you're my people, and uh, you're going to have a tabernacle, a place where God's presence would meet. All those things we've read about in the Old Testament. The reason why a Jew would have the advantage is because they had God's presence, had been with them for generation after generation. So the point is where God was already dealing and speaking, that's not to say that it was a disadvantage, it's saying it's an advantage. The only disadvantage is when God moves a, a, amongst us and around us uh, is when we say no. It's like a sinner that's, that, that's, you know, constantly under conviction by the Holy Spirit. And, and what happens is when every time no is said, every time no is, is said to God, then it becomes harder and the heart becomes harder. So the Jew does have it, an advantage because they were, the, the oracles of God were committed uh, to them. And, uh, and so you're going to notice here, and I think I put this on here, uh, where it says, as it is written, that's the first time of this particular chapter where that, where that said, and we're going to go through an entire segment where it's verse after verse after verse from the Old Testament, and we'll get to that here in just a minute. So a Jew would have the advantage simply because God had already approached them, they already had the, the influences of God in their life, all of that, Okay. All right, then notice as we uh, go to uh, verses 5 through 8. It says, But if our unrighteousness commend or would demonstrate or prove the righteousness of God, what shall we say is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? And in parentheses it says, I speak as a man. That's kind of Paul saying that, and yet the Holy Spirit is saying, I want you to have that, that thought within the, the words of God. It says, uh, God forbid, for then how shall God judge the world? For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? And not rather, as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come whose damnation is just. Now really to break that down and make you help, help you understand that in case you don't, it's, uh, it's, it's the same argument to this very day. If you notice what it, where it says there uh, in verse, uh, verse 8, as we be slanderously reported. Now, a slander is where someone says something about somebody to destroy their character, to, uh, to make them be in a bad light, and, and it's just not true. 
And unfortunately, that's, that's something that's been done every generation. Maybe we hear more about it now just simply because, you know, we've got the news and every time something happens. So there's slanders, there's things that said that's not true. There are people that sue other people that, that, that say things like that. Someone says, you can't slay, so that, that's slander. And there are certain times where you can uh, take someone to court if it's something that uh, is really damaging, and it's just not true. So Paul is saying here, here's the problem. He says, we are being slandered. And when you look at verse 8, it says, let us do evil that good may come. The argument that matches that in the modern version is this. Here's where people say uh, to people that believe you're saved eternally. They say, well, if a person believes you can be saved and you're always saved, then that means that person would go out and do anything they want to because they believe they're saved and nothing changes that. Well, see, that, that's, that's the enemy or someone slandering that says that. No one has ever spoken that from a pulpit. No Christian has ever stood up and testified and said, you know what? I'm so glad that I'm saved, therefore I can go out here and do anything I want. No Christian has ever said that. But the people that want to slander that truth have said that. And Paul is saying here that they're mocking him by saying, well, let's just do evil, that good may come. That's no different than saying, okay, then that means you can go ahead and do anything you want to since you're going to heaven. Now, what Christian has that attitude? None. No one has ever said that. So you find yourself in a position where Paul is saying we're being slandered because we're saying that the idea of, of keeping the law is not how a person is saved. And therefore, Paul, just like anybody that believes the truth, is going to be slandered. To make a statement like, let us do evil that good may come. Now, that's, no one has ever said that. And that's, uh, that's just part of how the truth gets criticized. So, uh, so we're going to move on for that because I want to spend a little bit more time in the, in the other places. All right, look at Romans 3, verses 9 through 18, okay? Verses 9 through 18, and in some Bibles, when it's an Old Testament reference, they will, uh, it'll be all caps on all the letters. Anybody got that in your Bible? Some, some, some Bibles, if it refers back to an Old Testament uh, reference, it'll have them all capped. My other Bible does this, but, but the point is, all the verses between uh, uh, verse uh, 9 and verse 17 specifically, all of these are found in the, uh, and I've got them written here, all of these are found in the Old Testament, and I have them broken down here, and, uh, and I won't stop at each one, but if you were to go back and read Psalm 14, 1 through 3, Psalm 10, 7, Isaiah 59, 7 and 8, and Psalm 36, 1, then you would find this. But notice what it says here. It says, what then? In other words, okay, so the argument is that people uh, have this idea that, that uh, this, this salvation by faith is, is not true or real. So he says in verse 9, what then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp or a poisonous snake is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. So this is a description of mankind. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, all of that is verses that I have there. So if you go back and, and, and read those, you'll see and say, oh, that's, that's basically what's, what was just said here. It is. Now, why would the Holy Spirit use Paul to do back to back to back to back verses from the Old Testament? Well, if you look at that little last phrase I put there, obviously used during a time when someone could justify themselves through the law. So the point is, and, and this is an argument, people, I've heard people say this, and it's just not true. People say, well, people got saved in the Old Testament different than the New Testament. That's just not true, folks. That's one of the reasons why these verses are here. It's saying here in the Old Testament during a time when if the keeping of the law was the way to heaven, then why in the world would it say, verses 9 through 17, this is just a short example of, of many verses where it's saying there's none that's good. It didn't say to him that keepeth the law they're good. No, it says there's none that's good. That's Old Testament. There's none that does right. And so all these things are being said to show, look, the idea that someone says there's, there's a different way now 
or the way through faith is not a way at all, look, there's never been a time where the law ever justified anybody. And we'll get into that uh, quite clearly here. And again, you need to know these things because you're going to meet people, you'll have family, you'll have people that will say things like this. And I'm here to tell you, Romans is a book that helped uh, those Roman believers hear these arguments. And uh, Paul is really addressing these things, of course, through the Holy Spirit. So notice verse 19 then, uh, 19 and 20. We're going to stop uh, with those two verses. It says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who were under the law, meaning that it's not just the law for people that they assume would break it like a Gentile, but again, the argument was by the Jewish people, well, we, we, we circumcise, we have the law, therefore we can judge you. Well, notice what it says there. Therefore by the, uh, sorry, now we know that what things soever the law saith, it said to them who were under the law, meaning that you that are a Jew, it, it applies to you too, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God, you see. Look at verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. That means to be made right. That's like a judge declaring innocence or guilt. God's saying you're justified. Now, the deeds of the law has never justified a person. I don't care who's preached that. I don't care how popular it sounded. I've heard people say it. It sounds good on paper, and it's almost like it's said to make Jesus look better. There has never been a time where the deeds of the law has saved anybody and the Bible just said that now people go well, I don't know about that because I've heard other people say it well when you hear other people say things then always go back to verse 4 let God be true but every man a liar because that's why the language is so strong here look it doesn't take anything from God Almighty his holiness and his righteousness and it certainly doesn't take anything from Jesus in fact, to me, it, it, it shows how much more we needed a Savior because the deeds of the law never justified anybody. So let's read that verse 20 again. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in this sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Now, that's been said many ways, but that's true. The law was given to show us we needed a Savior because we're sinful. The law was not given to say, say here, you keep that, and therefore you, you'll, you'll, you'll go to heaven. That's never been done. It was to show us how unrighteous we actually were. That's why verses 9 through 17 goes back and gives the description of man. And, uh, and by the way, it's, it, it's saying that anybody that sees others that way, and yet when you have the law, the law was saying, look, you're guilty before God. So that's an important thing. So notice verse 21 and 22. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. That's a very, very important statement there, okay? But now the righteousness of God it, without the law is manifested. Now, someone said, well, how in the world is that even possible? All right, well, let's read on here. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets, meaning that the law is not saying, I was one way to be saved, and now Jesus is another. No, all the law and all the prophets were all testifying that the righteousness of God without the law is being manifested. David said it. The Bible said, we'll read about it, not trying to get ahead here, but Abraham was, was uh, believed God, and it was accounted in him for righteousness. So there's never been a time where the law saved anybody. It was all about, um, all about pointing to a, to a Savior called Jesus. All right? So the righteousness of God, that's very important there. Uh, and then verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all that believe, for there is no difference. Now, we saw that as we studied the word believe. Now, when you look at that, when you're a child of God, the Holy Spirit makes that simple. And I'm going to tell you, people that don't believe, they struggle, they struggle, they struggle. And when I look at verse 22, and as I put down here, just my little two cents worth, notice it says the righteousness of God, not the righteousness of man. This is about standing before a righteous God. And if you have your own righteousness, you fail. You fail. I fail. And there'll, there'll be a lot of people try that. Well, look, this is what I did. This is what I did. You have to have the righteousness of God in order to have those sins remitted and, and to be holy and righteous in the sight of, of God, of course. And then uh, I think that's, and then of course, look, again, the idea when people say, well, all you got to do is believe. If people believe that, then they go out and do anything they want. See, I, I don't know if anybody's ever said it. Look, when people get saved, the Holy Spirit moves in. 
and the Holy Spirit teaches you how to live and how to live holy, how, how to live right. To be quite honest with you, when people want to argue this, I want to say, well, let me, let me follow you around. Let me see how perfect you are since you've been saved. You would assume that a person that just got saved, if they're supposed to be perfect when they just got saved, then where is the growth? Why, why would we preach to people? Why would you come to church and learn and, and, and all these things when, after all, when you get saved, that's the best you're ever going to be, and from then on, it's, it's, you'll, you'll never be any different? That's just not biblical, folks. There'd be no reason to have the church. There'd be no reason to have a preacher stand up and preach and be taught and, and, and to forgive one another. I mean, that's just, people that say that typically are the ones, if you, if you look at their lifestyle, are not the ones that would make it in by their own righteousness anyway. Now, I've met these people. I've, I've met people that, that I said, well, how do you know you're going to heaven? Well, I just don't do anything wrong. And you want to say, okay, I mean, you can't say, well, sure you have. But, I mean, that's just, that's just ignorant. That's someone that doesn't understand that, number one, yeah, we've all done wrong. Of course we have. And look at verse 23. Here's, this is really one that's hard to understand because we don't understand the glory and the, and the might of, of a holy God. But verse 23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So let's just assume someone has, not, has never sinned which is impossible because you have a sinful nature. But the idea that then the, the, the other part would be to attain the righteousness of God, all of that, all the glory of God. So we, we, we have fallen short in the sin, as far as sin goes, and we've fallen short of the glory of God. And, of course, verse 10 and verse 23 are wonderful verses to begin to help people understand the need to be saved. Uh, never let it be said, you can say it about me or anybody else, when I go soul winning and people knock, well, you, you mean people can pray a prayer and they'll get saved? Uh, well, in the Bible, that's how they did it. Hello? Can I get any amens there? Or, or am, I, am I literally preaching to people? Well, I don't know about that. Well, I tell you what, the thief on the cross pr prayed a prayer that, that if I heard that prayer, I'd say, well, I don't know about that. Remember me when you come into your kingdom? But what did the Lord say? Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. That's, look, it's the Lord who saves. I don't save anybody. And when we start thinking we've got to be the judge of it, then, then we're going to be wrong most of the time. Because God Almighty is the one who saves, and a person that believes, that's between them and God anyway. But I'll say this, we've all sinned, and we've all fallen short of the, the glory of God. So let's finish the rest of this. Now notice this, because this is very wonderful language. It's very encouraging for all of us, because when it says all have sinned, then it means everybody then can be saved. It's not saying, well, the good ones, you're going to make it in, but the sinners, well, sorry, uh, you're, just, you, you're just too bad. Uh, if all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, then that means everybody needs a Savior, and uh, that's a wonderful thing because uh, that's what Jesus, that's part of the plan. So look at verse 24. Being justified freely. Now, that kind of goes along with the idea of freely. Now, what's freely? That means no strings attached. God's the one who justifies, being justified freely by his grace. That's God's goodness, not my own goodness, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, okay? So we've got, uh, you know, the Easter season, as we call it, coming up. But the point is that for there to be a resurrection, there had to be a death. That death was to bring redemption. Redemption is a purchasing of. So a man was, it's like going, it's like someone who, who takes something down to the pawn shop, okay? You don't have any money. You take a ring and say, you know, I'm going to, I need some money and I'm going to put this ring here and uh, I hope I can come back and, and repurchase this. Well, man was lost. Man was, was gone. And Jesus says, I'm going to redeem man back. And Jesus was purchased back to God with the blood of Christ. The highest price ever paid. Uh, and that's what redemption is. So redemption is, is the purchased possession of a soul that has believed, of course. And, uh, you know, when God purchases something, I don't see anywhere in the Bible he, he puts it back up for sale. Uh, that, that, that don't happen. Now, I know a lot of people use a lot of these cliches and all of that, but I, I like the Bible. I really do. I like what the Bible says. And if we'll stick with the Bible, then, then we'll, we'll have real good confidence here. So being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, notice the colon, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. That word propitiation is like it fulfills the demands of God. Uh, God demanded a perfect sacrifice, that's Jesus. Uh, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Then Jesus fulfilled that by being the Lamb of God. 
of course, a perfect blood, the sacrifice, that's why it had to be done. Years ago, I remember my grandmother, uh, my, my grandmother, when she got a little bit older, uh, was having problems sleeping, and she would listen to the radio at night, and she would listen. Some of these, these people that came on only came on real, like, 2 and 3 in the morning. I'm sure they were recorded. But there were some preachers. There was a famous preacher. I won't say his name because he's popular even to this day. So I won't say his name because some of you go, I, I listen to him daily. Well, then I won't say it just so I, I'm not purposely trying to be unkind. But there was a man who said on the radio, as my grandmother was sitting there listening, couldn't sleep, she said he made something, a statement like this. She said, well, you know, the sacrifice of Jesus was simply the most important thing is that he, he gave his life. It's not the fact that he, he died and shed his blood. He's trying to minimize the blood, and he went on and on about the blood. Now, bear in mind, my grandmother had already left the denomination that she grew up with, and I mean everybody in her family from going all the way back to Noah and the ark. That's the way they were. And to be quite honest with you, they were known in the day as uh, very strong biblically, but they started distancing themselves from the blood of Jesus, so she decided to go to a, to a Baptist church because, uh, and that was hard for her because everybody thought, what, what would you do that for? Well, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with people that emphasize the blood. So here's my point. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. In the Garden of Eden, animals died just to clothe Adam and Eve. I mean, God took animals and killed them, skinned them, clothed Adam and Eve. There's a picture there. Then when they had children, Cain says, well, I, I'm going to bypass this blood thing and I'll bring, you know, the, you know, the labor of my hands, the, the garden, the vegetables, all that stuff. And God says, no, 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 no. That's not acceptable. It has nothing to do with you versus your brother. It's just that your brother brings what I've asked and that's a sacrifice. So it's always been that way. So when this famous preacher said uh, Jesus could have died anyway, and he mentioned things like he could have been hung, he could have been this or that, but he didn't have to literally shed his blood. Well, he, he was wrong on that, folks, because the Bible tells me here that uh, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Now, you say when people die, not everybody's blood comes out. You could die a lot of ways. You could be smothered, but you know what? When Jesus was called the Lamb of God by John the Baptist, there's a reason why Jesus died by shedding his blood. There's a reason for that because he was the Lamb of God and the shedding of blood was fulfilling everything that, that all those animals, they took an animal and they killed an animal. They didn't just say, well, we've killed the animal, his life has been sacrificed, and that's the important thing. No. You know what they did? They took the blood out of that animal. Now, we know on that Passover night, they literally took the blood of that animal and put it in a basin. Okay, it's kind of gory, I understand that, but God says, here's what you're going to do. And you're going to take a hiss of a plant, and you're going, to, you're going to swipe the blood over the lentils and the doorpost, and when the death angel comes through, then he will pass over. You see, that's where that name comes from. The blood's very necessary. That's why we'll continue to sing nothing but the blood. There's power in the blood and all that kind of stuff. You know why? Because that is important. Because the Bible says so. You say, well, it turns people off. Look. I'd rather turn Jesus, be turned on to Jesus and Jesus be turned on to me than to, than to try to appease a world. That's the mess we're in today. And people all the time, well, I, look, I'd rather, I'd rather have the same amount if I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. And I'm not talking about being a lazy rascal and just saying, well, we don't have anybody because that's the way it is. No, I believe you can work hard, but you know what? Noah worked hard, others worked hard. Jeremiah preached his guts out and never had one convert. And God says, you did the right thing. So the point is, is that, but to say, well, we could have more if we did this. Yeah, and I've seen those churches, and I don't care if they, they run thousands, and they do till, till Jesus comes. There's still something wrong with people that compromise and don't do it God's way. Now, I know there's probably people in your little, the little gears that turn your head. Well, I, yeah, I know. I know what you're saying. But look, I'd rather have God's favor. I'd rather let Jesus build the church. And uh, if he don't, then I don't, I, wouldn't, I don't want to be part of a church even for, to have the name. I don't care what it is because I've seen how that goes. And it's what really, what really shows it is in the children of the people who buy into that. This big movement, all this, this contemporary music, you look at their children. They're not, they're not closer to God. They're further away from God. They live a more a more lifestyle, more like the world, in fact, worse than the world oftentimes. Jesus said, wisdom is justified in her children. He says, you go ahead and say what you want to about me and about these, these Pharisees, but I tell you, 
you watch the influence of, of, of both. I'd rather have an influence that's going to lead people to live a holy life, a righteous life, to be attend church and give praise to God and, and all of that than to be people that say one thing, but boy, you watch their kids and what does it, I, I, I've seen it. There's nothing yet shallow. And the people that's a part of that movement have even, have even said that. We got a lot of people, but we're shallow. We got people. Look, when they went up in Chicago years and years ago, one of the big guys that kind of got this uh, contemporary movement really going, he went door to door, just like, like we do soul winning. And they did a survey. What would you like in a church if we start one here? They went in the suburbs of Chicago. I, those suburbs, I'm, I know exactly where they're at. And they built a giant, I'll use the word church in parentheses, okay? They went door to door and says, what do you want? Well, here's what we want, here's what we want. They didn't ask them if they're saved. They were asking lost, saved, all of them. What do you think lost people are going to want in a church? And one of the big ones was the music. Yeah, yeah. And they started that and people said, whoa, look at that. And people was waiting and it looked like they were praising God. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I've seen people do that. And then you let someone come in and try to preach a Bible message, they've got nothing to do with them. I went to a place that didn't even have a pulpit for me to preach at. Well, we, we make a big deal about the music. We'll get something so you can prop your Bible on it. They're more interested in the show, more interested in the feelings. I want to see what those people do when, when the trials of life come. And I'm going to tell you something. A lot of that stuff, there's nothing to it. And I'm telling you that because this idea of people that want to mock uh, the blood and want to mock salvation by, by grace through faith in Jesus. Go right ahead. But people that's going to get saved and have their life changed are going to do it God's way, not any way that, that the world says, you better do it this way or it's not going to happen. All right, let's move on here. Verse 25. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Again, notice his righteousness. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness. That's Paul, Paul's way of saying, just to let you know, we're talking about his righteousness, okay? That he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. It's God who justifies us, certainly we don't justify ourselves. And I like this in verse 27, where is boasting then? Who, to what extent and, and where do we begin to boast? Wherefore is boasting then? It is excluded, meaning from, a, from the man's standpoint, by what law? Of works? Nay or no, but by the law of faith, you see. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Now, a saved person looks at that and goes, well, of course, that, that makes, that's about as plain as it gets. And yet, people struggle with that. There are some very sincere people. They'll, they'll talk about, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. They asked D.L. Moody one time, he says, could you... Could you, Mr. Moody, could you tell us, uh, you know, there's a lot of religions in this world. What, what's, what's kind of the difference in all of them? He said, well, it really boils down to two things. There's a done religion and a do religion. All the religions of the world except for one say you got to do something, you got to do something, you got to do something. We're talking about some, some works. But there's one, if you want to call it religion, is where it's already been done. Jesus did it all. It is finished. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Now, that hair lips some people. Now, when people hear that that's not saved, and I know we'll address this here in just a minute, they automatically go to a place where they say, well, then that means you could do anything you want to. That's what an unsaved person would think. And by the way, I wonder how many people thought, well, I could, then I could, I could be a Christian that way because, sure, I could, I, could, I could say something and not believe anything, and then I could go around and just do anything I want to. That's called an unsaved person. I don't care how much they attend church. I don't care if they stand behind a pulpit and sing songs that makes people cry. And, and I've seen people cry and boo-hoo. And some of those people know, doesn't know God more, any more than a man in the moon. And I'm telling you that because, look, what's genuine is, is certainly God has to be involved in this. So the boasting, then where is the boasting? Well, it has to be in God. It has to be in God. So verse 29, is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith, which that's the Jew by faith, and the uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. So no one's ever said the law doesn't mean anything. Of course it does. If people got saved like they're supposed to, 
No one says, well, I can do anything I want to. There's the other side. And we'll get to that a little bit further. But I know people, they, well, I'm saved and I've got this liberty in Jesus. Mm. Okay. This liberty means that you can do anything you want to. Look like the world, smell like the world, do like the world. But praise the Lord, i got this liberty in Jesus. See, people, there's something that stinks wrong with, with that sentiment too. Just as bad as someone that says, well, you got to do something to get in or, or it don't mean anything. I'm so glad that the Bible tells me what's the truth. And if I have the Lord in my heart, uh, I always say this, and, and this is, is going to sound like I'm bragging, but I say, look, I've met people that say they're going to heaven by their works. I lived in an area of a denomination that it was works, 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 and the sister cousin of that religion, that's what they said too. As a matter of fact, uh, I was forbidden to do a funeral in a church literally within minutes of getting ready to do this funeral. Tragic accident happened. A lady was killed in a car accident. Uh, cars were passing like this, and a man from the Chicago area up on the UP of Michigan was swiping at a B, lost control of his pickup, hit head on with uh, a lady. It was her sister who died, wasn't it? And uh, they wanted me to, to do the funeral. And uh, evidently she was connected with a, uh, I won't say the denomination, but she's connected with a certain church. And I said, I'd, I'd be glad to do it, be glad to help. Well, I get there on the day of the funeral, and uh, a man approaches me before I get inside the building. He says, I'm sorry, you're not going to be able to do this funeral here. And I said, well, why is that? And he was the pastor, by the way. And I said, why is that? And this is, this is almost exactly what he said. He says, because you believe that a person can call upon the name of the Lord and they can be saved. And I said, yeah, I do believe that. He said, well, we don't. He was mocking someone who would call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Now, there's people that still do that. This religion, they're all about the works. But here's, here's what I've noticed. I said, well, to myself, I don't think I've ever sold this to somebody. I could have gotten the flesh and said to somebody, so I've got to think about if I've ever done this or not. Because I want to be honest here. But I said, you know what? If going to heaven by works is how you get there, then I'll dead sure bank on the works that I'm doing, like going to church as much as I go to church and doing all that I do because I tell you, in these two separate religions, I tell you what they depend upon. Someone took a little bitty baby down to a man, put that little bitty baby under a little thing of water and splashed water on it, and said, now we're going to end up with the church. Now, I think you probably know what I'm talking about. I'm trying to be very kind here, because there's a day I, I wasn't very kind about this, or maybe I was trying to just emphasize the truth. Folks, number one, if a baby dies, do you think they're going to go to hell because somebody didn't sprinkle some water on them? Who really believes that one? No, that don't happen that way. But that's exactly why when I would go soul wing and I'd say, they say, well, I've already been baptized. Well, let me, I, I, I'm curious about that because, I, well, maybe they've had a conversion and they're just, they say that because some people do say that. Well, I was baptized when I was a baby, an infant, I think they said. And I go, okay. And then I'd proceed to give them the gospel. It's almost like, well, that doesn't matter because my church told me that you've got to be part of the church or you can't go to heaven, which is exactly what they teach. If you're not part of the church, you can't go to heaven. What church did the thief on the cross belong to? And by the way, who baptized him? I mean, if that's really what's necessary, you say, well, that's kind of an extreme example. The point is, that's why the Bible says what it says, and I'm just going to stick with the Bible. And by the way, I, I know this because all I can speak for is for myself. Now, I can look at others and say, well, they're faithful to church. They seem to love the Lord. I get that. I believe God gives us the Holy Spirit, and there's that connection. But I'll say this because I'm the only one that, that I indeed know in my heart as best I can know it. I know in my heart when I put my trust in Jesus and the Holy Spirit's there and the things I know I shouldn't do, I'm told don't do that. Even the things that's even, that's, that people say, well, there's nothing really wrong with that. The other side, Lord, I, I, but I want to please you. Now, that's the Holy Spirit speaking because I got saved, not because I've kept the deeds of the law. Not, and to be honest with you, if it, was, if it was about that, I'd certainly bank on my good deeds versus the people that say they're going the other way because I, 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 I be honest with you, the, 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 there's not much example of their good deeds, to be quite honest with you. So all that to say, God says uh, we don't make void the law. We establish it. So that's why when Jesus says, I'm done here, that's why when